This video in the Clinical Toxicology series is about ethanol toxicity and ethanol withdrawal, which corresponds with two chapters in Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies, Chapter 76 and 77. For some topics we're covering in this Clinical Toxicology course, I'm going to be redeploying material I'd previously created for other groups of learners. There's no need to reinvent the wheel when I already have recordings made for medical students, resident physicians training in emergency medicine, or EM residency graduates getting subspecialty training in wilderness medicine, or materials I've created to teach other medical toxicologists. I will note, however, that my skills in creating and editing videos are, at least by my own estimation, notably better now than it's been in the past, so I'll apologize in advance for any variability in quality. These recordings that I'm using may be referencing some other textbooks, such as Katsung's Pharmacology and Auerbach's Wilderness Medicine, but you're not expected to own or to have read those books. The relevant chapters from Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies will be indicated to you within the video and or through Canvas. In addition, I've edited my previous recordings specifically for the Clinical Toxicology course, so you'll be seeing a shortened version where extraneous materials have been removed if they applied to other historical audiences, but not to you as PharmD students. Even so, this particular video is on the longer side because it contains several video illustrations. So, with all those caveats, let's get started with ethanol and ethanol withdrawal. The objectives of this presentation are that by the time we finish and you study, you should be able to sketch the biochemical pathway for ethanol metabolism and indicate where flumepazole and disulfiram act. You should be able to relate blood alcohol levels, or BAC, blood alcohol content, to the degree of CNS depressant effect expected. You should be able to identify adverse health effects of chronic ethanol ingestion. Ethanol is a drug. It is an amazingly commonly used drug. About 75% of adults in the U.S. will use it on a fairly routine basis, making it the most commonly abused drug in the world. Ethanol, interestingly, is also a food. Think of a few centuries ago, maybe even a few millennia ago, you could pick some fruit off the tree or you could harvest your grain, but eventually it's going to go bad. But if we can convert those carbohydrates into ethanol, that is a way of preserving those calories. In addition, the liquid that you're making containing the alcohol in it will inhibit microorganism growth, and that might reduce the risk of illness from drinking that beverage compared to drinking potentially contaminated water. Each standard drink really contains about the same absolute amount of alcohol in it. So a standard Beer has 12 ounces, and it's about 5% alcohol by volume. The standard shot of hard spirits, one and a half ounces, is 40% alcohol by volume. And the standard glass of wine is 5 ounces, and it's about 12%. If you do the math, they all have just over about 14 grams of ethanol per unit dose. One question I get asked fairly frequently is, how drunk does somebody get if they drink one drink? So for a theoretical calculation, we're going to assume a 70 kilogram person who drinks one standard drink, and to make the math easier, that there's instantaneous absorption and distribution. Not true, but it's going to make the math easier. So they consumed 14,400 milligrams, and we have to divide that by the volume into which it is distributed. The 70 kilograms times the volume of distribution of water in a man, which is 0.6 liters per kilogram, that is 342 milligrams per liter. So the corresponding serum ethanol level report that we'd expect from the laboratory would be 34.2 milligrams per deciliter. Well, how drunk is that? Well, we need to compare it to some standards for the BAC or blood alcohol content. And to convert serum ethanol levels into blood alcohol content levels, we actually have to take the serum ethanol level and divide it by about 1.14 because the amount of ethanol isn't exactly the same in the serum as it is inside the blood cells. Anyway, you do that conversion, you get a BAC of about 0.03%. Whereas the legal limit in California and many other states is 0.08%. So one drink is going to get you about halfway there to being legally intoxicated. So of course, the Department of Motor Vehicles is very interested in this sort of thing and wants to, people to avoid driving under the influence. And so that's where I got this table right here. It says the only safe drinking 
limit is when you don't drink anything at all. Okay, that's fine. But where are we in the I'm not quite legally impaired yet? And you can look across the top based upon body weight and pounds. They separate males and females because there are differences in distribution of water between males and females that we will get to. And you see, it doesn't really take very many drinks. Basically, for a lot of people, it's two or three drinks, and you're going to be legally intoxicated. Makes sense. I just told you each drink will get you at about 0.03, whereas the limit is 0.08. What about the pharmacokinetics of ethanol? It's pretty rapidly absorbed, although if you drink along with eating a lot of food, that will delay the absorption somewhat. Ethanol is freely water soluble and it distributes just into body water. So its volume of distribution is the volume of distribution of water in our body, which is somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 liters per kilogram. If you take a woman drinking compared to a man drinking and look at the peak ethanol level they get, Women get higher peak ethanol levels. There are several reasons for this. The average woman weighs less than the average man, so there's just not as much mass to dissolve it into. Women have a lower percent of body water, which is kind of a kind way of saying they have a higher percentage of body fat relative to men on average. And also, there's less first pass metabolism in the GI tract, actually at the gut mucosa level in women than there is in men. So all of these contribute to having higher peak levels in women than men on an absolute amount of alcohol consumed basis. Most of the ethanol metabolism is in the liver. It is also eliminated from the body in the urine and it's also eliminated from the body through the lungs. In fact, this is the basis for breathalyzer testing. A certain amount of ethanol is going to be exhaled in your breath and it is proportional to how much is in your serum. And the metabolism of ethanol, at clinically relevant ethanol levels, it is zero order metabolism. All of the enzyme systems are saturated, and so you can only metabolize a maximum amount of ethanol per unit of time. And you only get down to the levels where you get first order metabolism at ethanol levels that are so low that they are clinically irrelevant. Here is a figure showing ethanol metabolism. Hint, this is something that you really ought to be able to reproduce. So we start with ethanol at the top, and it gets metabolized, gets oxidized through alcohol dehydrogenase. This is the rate limiting step. So ethanol gets oxidized to acetaldehyde. So if something gets oxidized, something has to be reduced, and it's NAD plus getting reduced. Now the acetaldehyde is very rapidly converted into acetate, through aldehyde dehydrogenase, and then the acetate becomes an acetyl group, acetyl-CoA, and then it goes into the Krebs cycle, and we can generate some ATP from the ethanol. Now, there is another way that ethanol can be oxidized to acetaldehyde through the MEOS, or Microsomal Ethanol Oxidizing System. This is just another term for the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. You know that alcohol can induce cytochrome P450 enzymes, and this normally very small side pathway can become significant in someone who is a chronic ethanol abuser. How fast do people metabolize ethanol? Most people will metabolize one drink's worth of alcohol roughly every hour to hour and a half. Now, if you were to just stop and track how fast does the level go down, the serum ethanol level in almost everybody will decrease around 18 to 25 milligrams per deciliter per hour. So you can use this clinically to determine how long is it going to take this patient with a known ethanol level to sober up. Their ethanol level now, say, is 300 milligrams per deciliter. How many hours is it going to be before it's down to, say, 80 milligrams per deciliter, right around the legal limit? Well, you take the 300 minus the 80, divide it by roughly 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour, and you can see it's going to take a lot of hours to do that. So now I'm going to be talking about some drugs that affect ethanol metabolism. So this is the same figure I showed you before, but I put in this drug disulfiram and this drug fomepazole over here. Fomepazole is a very potent alcohol dehydrogenase inhibitor. And we would never use it on someone who is drunk with ethanol. Now, if you did, they can't turn the ethanol into acetaldehyde. It just stays around for a very long time. So you could say, oh, I just had a couple of drinks. I take some fomepazole. I can just stay drunk all night. That's just way too expensive of a way to go. Fomepazole is too expensive. It's much cheaper just to buy more booze. 
However, where fomepazole is used therapeutically is in toxic alcohol poisoning. Disulfiram also goes by the name antabuse because it is against alcohol abuse. It inhibits that next step, the aldehyde dehydrogenase. This allows the acid aldehyde, which normally never accumulates, to accumulate. And aldehydes are very nasty substances that will cause flushing, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headache. In rare cases, it can cause hypotension. There are some people who have a genetic aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency, and most of these people tend to be of Asian ancestry. And so here is a picture demonstrating that. Young man, before he drinks, he has an aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. He takes a drink, moves his hair a little bit, and you can see that his skin is quite flush due to the cutaneous vasodilation from the acid aldehyde buildup. What are the acute clinical effects of ethanol? It's a central nervous system depressant. And you can see that you get more severe clinical effects the higher your blood alcohol content is. Now, most of the time, people are trying to get somewhere in this area where you subjectively feel high, but you do have some sedation and some slower reaction times. And then you get higher and higher levels, and you get closer and closer to death, potentially. Now, notice this is talking about non-tolerant individuals. As people who chronically are exposed to ethanol can tolerate some pretty high levels that would probably kill you or me, or at least me. How is it that we get the CNS depressant mechanism for eth ethanol? Ethanol may potentiate GABA-A receptors. So the GABA-A receptor enhances inhibitory tone. Or maybe the ethanol can inhibit glutamate action at the NMDA receptor so we can block excitatory tone. Either one of those can cause CNS depression. But why is it then that people who drink tend to get loud and boisterous and start fights? That doesn't make any sense for something which is supposed to be sedating them. Well, the reason is that at typically desired therapeutic doses, ethanol is actually a disinhibitor. Normally, we have a lot of baseline inhibitory tone in our CNS that prevents us from doing stupid things, but we can actually disinhibit that and so we will go on and have this excitatory phase where we might go on and do something that we otherwise might not have. Other acute clinical effects of ethanol, it can cause depression of myocardial contractility, but typically at levels very much higher than you're going to see clinically. It can cause smooth muscle relaxation. You get a vasodilatory effect. So actually, alcohol will make you feel warmer but you're actually getting colder because this cutaneous vasodilation allows you to radiate more heat. Now, back in the days of old, they actually used ethanol to help suppress premature labor because if you could cause uterine smooth muscle relaxation, you could prevent that woman from going into labor. We have better medicines now, including the beta agonists, to do this. Ethanol causes, as we've probably all discovered, a diuresis. It inhibits antidiuretic hormone secretion. And at the same time, you're usually drinking a lot of volume of free fluid. So combine those, and you have to go to the bathroom fairly frequently. And in fact, Shakespeare was a little bit of a pharmacologist in this scene from Macbeth. The porter says, drink is a great provoker of three things. And Macduff responds, what three things does drink especially provoke? And the porter says, nose painting, the cutaneous vasodilation. It causes sleep or CNS depression and causes urine, the consequence of inhibition of antidiuretic hormone. Now, chronic exposure to ethanol, as we've all heard, can cause effects on the liver. And this can come in stages. The first kind of changes in your liver you might see is called alcoholic fatty liver. And at this point, you'll see some large fat vacuoles in the liver cells. This is reversible. And if you were to check somebody's labs, the liver labs, the transaminases like AST and ALT, they are normal at this point. When this gets worse, you can develop an alcoholic hepatitis. Now you'll see some elevations in your hepatic transaminases, but it's still reversible at this point. If you continue to expose your liver chronically to alcohol, you can develop hepatic cirrhosis. Cirrhosis just means scarring. There's this chronic inflammatory state. And as your body's dealing with it, it lays down a lot of fibroblasts. And you get this irreversible scarring from the chronic inflammation. 
Ultimately, if this gets bad enough, it can lead to liver failure, and it can also increase your risk of gastrointestinal bleeding because you have all of these GI-related veins that become dilated because of this backup of venous blood through the now scarred liver. In addition, if your liver cells aren't working well, you aren't making clotting factors as well, and you can be coagulopathic. It's a bad setup. Chronic exposure to ethanol causes ethanol tolerance. Nobody really complains about tolerance. They just realize, I now need to drink more beers before I get the effect that I want. Interestingly, acutely, during one single drinking session, you can develop acute tolerance, which is to say, when you're first drinking, a particular serum ethanol level will make you a certain amount of drunk, and then you go up through a peak and you're coming down on the other side, and that same serum ethanol level now, after you've been on alcohol for a few hours, you are less affected by it. You're less drunk. That is hyperacute tolerance. As I alluded to before, in addition, chronic users can tolerate ethanol levels that would seriously harm non-users. So you have to be careful interpreting the lab values. It's not that rare that I'll see a serum ethanol level of 300 or 400 milligrams per deciliter, and the lab will report this as fatal, and the person is awake and talking to me. Similarly, someone who's chronically exposed to alcohol could even be going through alcohol withdrawal at what would be for somebody else a seriously intoxicating level. With regard to dependence and withdrawal, ethanol is a CNS depressant. It makes sense that withdrawal from it will result in a hyperexcitable state. So ceasing or decreasing ethanol can cause anxiety, you feel bad, tachycardia, hypertension, you can get tremulous from it or you can have seizures, and then also you can have hallucinations. They tend to be visual hallucinations only, and the classic thing that people can see is pink elephants. So it's interesting that this pink elephant says, drink or I'll die. Really what he needs to say is, drink and then stop drinking or I'll die. Delirium tremens is the most severe form of ethanol withdrawal, and we often call it DTs for short. DTs is terrible, has a pretty high mortality if left untreated. Maybe about a third of patients can die from this. Now, if you make it to a hospital nowadays, you probably shouldn't die at all. But in the past and before we had good ICU level care, this was a really dangerous thing to have. But it's not just ethanol withdrawal that makes something DTs. You actually have to be delirious, that delirium part. You have to have some change in your mental status. And then you also need to be exhibiting some kind of autonomic instability. You will have some abnormal vital signs, very commonly tachycardia, hypertension, diaphoresis, uncontrolled sweating, for instance. And so many people will say, oh, I have DTs, or I was admitted to the hospital for DTs. What they really meant was I was having alcohol withdrawal, and I don't know what to call it other than DTs. And just a little plug right here for my favorite Belgian beer. It goes by the name Delirium Tremens, and I think it's awesome how they have a pink elephant on their label. Here is a graph that comes from the chapter, giving you a general idea of the time course of withdrawal. Down here along the bottom, days since alcohol discontinuation. It might only be a several hours before somebody starts developing anxiety and tremor. Seizures tend to occur relatively early after you stop drinking alcohol within the first couple of days, and you might also have relatively early on some visual hallucinations. But it takes some time to actually develop a full-blown case of delirium tremens, a couple of days. And that person ought to have some abnormal mental status, abnormal vital signs. It's not just your person who says, I feel a little shaky because I stopped drinking yesterday. Next, I want to show you a number of videos that I found on YouTube demonstrating some signs and symptoms of ethanol withdrawal. If you're watching this at 1.5 or 2.0 speed, I'm really going to recommend that you watch these videos at 1.0 speed. That's going to give you a much better idea of the frequency of the tremor and other findings that are demonstrated here. So this first video is of a patient presenting to the hospital, apparently in India, and he's demonstrating some tremor in his hands as part of his ethanol withdrawal syndrome. And now we see this patient with ethanol withdrawal demonstrating tremor of the tongue. Indeed, I think it's the same patient that we just saw with hand tremor. 
I personally find tremor of the tongue to be a rather reliable sign. If you're asking a patient to hold out their hands to see if they have a tremor, they can actually kind of fake it a little bit, but it's really, really difficult to try to fake a tongue tremor. The third video here was recorded by a friend of the patient being depicted, trying to demonstrate to him how he was having an ethanol withdrawal seizure. Look out. Out the way, mate. Neil. Neil, get on your side. Neil! Get on your side. Neil! Neil! Neil, get down, mate. Neil! 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 Look out, mate. Stay there. Neil! Fucking nightmare. Neil! 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 Neil, come on! Neil! 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 Get down, mate! Come on! You alright? Get on your back! You alright? Stay there, don't try and move! Just stay there! Can you hear me? Neil! Just stay there. Just stay there. You've had a fucking fit again. Get down, Mac. Just scared the life out of Mac again. Who? You. By having a fit. You did. You just had a fit. When? Just a second ago. Yeah, get that off and open that. That one's, that one's dead. That one's dead. What? That one is dead. Now you want to take your tablets and you want to find some potassium, whatever that potassium is. You sort the f***ing tablets out and get them down your neck. He's all right. Reassure Matt that you're all right because he's worried about you. You knocked it all down there when you had a fit. Just a second ago, I've got it all on tape. I filmed you this time. What well, day is it? What day is it? Well, your lighter, there's your lighter there. There. What day is it? I don't know. Get your tablets and take them. Your tablets that you have to take daily. And you need some of that potassium in you. What? What tablets do you have about? Your daily tablets that you normally have to take. About what tablets am I on about? They're in that bag down there. Your thiamine, your vitamin B. You can take two of my diary pan and go to bed. You need something to eat. Some other chronic clinical effects of ethanol exposure. Patients can develop Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. This is a kind of malnutrition related to vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency. So as I mentioned before, the alcoholics, they can still generate plenty of ATP from the alcohol. But if that's all of their caloric intake is through alcohol, they're going to be malnourished in other ways. So Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome has two parts to it. There's Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is characterized by altered mental status, ataxia, they're unsteady on their feet, and then they'll also have ophthalmoplegia, some impairment of extraocular movement. So when you're examining these people and 
holding your finger in front of their face and asking them to look in different directions, they're not going to be able to do it as well. They might be complaining of double vision as they are doing it. And then the second part to Wernicke-Korsakoff is Korsakoff's psychosis. This is an interesting kind of memory impairment or amnesia, and it's characterized typically by confabulation. This is to say, you'll ask the patient some questions, they're answering your questions, and what they say, it will seem to make sense, but they're just making it up on the spot, and they might not even realize they're making it up on the spot. Next, I'm going to show you two more videos demonstrating some complications of chronic ethanol use, including Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. The first bit is about a five and a half minute film clip produced in 1979, and this opens with a patient with delirium tremens. Later on, we're going to see ataxia and amnesia from Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. And then after that is an audio-only clip demonstrating some pretty remarkable confabulation. His case was referred to Dr. Shaw, consultant psychiatrist to the Bexley Group of Hospitals. The case of Mr. Boomer is fairly typical of the presentation of the alcoholic to the casualty department. It's often forgotten that accidents, illnesses and operations may give rise to confusional episodes in alcoholics and that these confusional episodes, or delirium tremens, can be life-threatening and require immediate, appropriate treatment. In the malnourished alcoholic, there is the additional hazard that such a delirious episode may progress to Wernicke's encephalopathy. Should this occur, the patient passes, firstly, from the restless, excitable, delirious stage over a period of a day or so into a lethargic, somnolent, semi-stuporose phase with a variable degree of mental confusion. Secondly, cerebellar ataxia develops involving mainly the trunk and lower limbs. The degree of ataxia may be such that the patient is unable to stand unaided. Well, you can see the careful wide-based walk, the trunkal incoordination there, very marked. You can see the careful Attempts to turn, very difficult. Can he just walk back now? I just stand up for a second and get rid, rid of some of this nervousness in the Okay. Right. Again, you can see the marked in coordination. Thirdly, ophthalmoplegias develop of varying degrees of severity, the most common finding being bilateral rectus palsy. The outcome of the acute condition is grave. Some 10% of patients will die, and almost 80% will progress to the chronic condition, the Korsakoff psychosis. We have a patient who demonstrates some of the features of this chronic condition. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Dr. Shaw is my name. Please meet you, Dr. Shaw. I'd like you, first of all, to Remember a date for me, if you will. This is the 10th of July, 1979. Now, I just want to ask you a few questions. What has your memory been like? Poor, very poor. Been very poor, and you've been aware of that. But I know that you're quite good at arithmetic, aren't you? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, can you take 85 from 123? 38. Very good. How many thripney bits are there in three and nine pins? Um, 50. Very good. Do you know the name of this hospital? No, I don't know. Well, it begins with a B. Bexley. Bexley, that's very good, yes. What was that date I asked you to remember? I can't remember, sir. Did I ask you to remember a date? That's what I mean, I can't remember. You can't even remember if I asked you to remember it? No, yes. I see. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How long do you think you've been here now? I've no idea at all. You've no idea. This seems like the first day, I don't know. I see. Uh -huh. Yes. We've been here now for f five months. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No way, no way. I see. No. Where have you come from then? 
Where did you come from to this hospital? I don't know anything of my home address. And where is that? In Port Glasgow. I see. But you haven't lived in Port Glasgow for the past ten years. Oh, yes. Have you? Yes. Well, he clearly shows the major symptom of the Korsakoff psychosis, that is, the memory disturbance. It's clear that he's unable to form new memories, although, interestingly enough, if the memory is jogged, the information may then be recalled. You'll remember, for example, that we gave him the initial of the hospital's name, and he was then able to recall the name of the hospital. He shows also the, the retrospective memory gap, in his case, extending backwards over many years. He last remembers being in Port Glasgow as a man of 41. He is, in fact, a man of 48 years of age, and he has not been in the Post Port Glasgow area for many years. Despite this, his intellectual grasp is well retained, and he's able to do quite complicated sums in his head. Well, here we have a man, 48 years of age, with many years ahead of him, but in his case, uh, he is permanently disabled. Where are you right now? I'm in the service. Are you? Yes. How long have you been in the service? I've been in the service for quite some time. Have you? What branch of the service are you in? We're in the Navy. Oh, wonderful. Where are we right now? Right now, mm -hmm. we're aboard ship. We're aboard ship. How long? We're south, just south, south, south Pacific. How's the weather out right now? Well, it's quite about right. Is it? It's not bad. How's uh, the journey been so far? The journey been has been pretty good. Has it? The next day, Jack had to go to the pound um, finer for finer for for his final final ball knife, reader, and sweater ball. Bess found in the pound that her doll, carriage, pencil box, and the roller skates. One night might buy, one might win her hat, doll, carriage, pencil box, and roller skates. Okay, now let me ask you something. Tell me what you read, will you? <coughs> what did you read just um, there? <laughs> what all you mean? Yeah, just, just, what just, all out, in, in, just outline it for me. Oh, it seems like it was a girl that was trying to get she went uh, enlisted in the Navy with her husband, uh -huh. and uh, there was various ways he could get back into. Um, he get into a, a calling. Uh, oh, I don't know what you'd call it, a way of uh, a status, yeah. whereby they uh, would be doing something religiously. And this is what you just read to us, huh? The management of patients with acute ethanol intoxication. We've probably all been involved with this with uh, some friends. It's mostly just supportive care. If someone is severely intoxicated and they're not breathing, they probably need to be endotracheally intubated and ventilated, and that should prevent most deaths from severe intoxication. Hopefully, you're never going to get that bad. Someone is intoxicated, they are going to metabolize the alcohol away. Is there any way to make it go faster? Well, in extreme cases, you can remove the ethanol with hemodialysis. Many patients can recover and they don't even need to be hospitalized for it as long as they're hemodynamically stable and have adequate supervision, basically an adult that can bring them back or call 911 if anything bad happens. Just because you're drunk, you don't have to stay in the hospital, but then the question comes, who's going to bring them home? Do they even have a home? Who is going to be the responsible party? So I'm going to tell you the story right now of a liquid breakfast, the story of Little Jimmy, although I did change the names to protect the innocent here. This is based upon an actual case that I was involved with. So Little Jimmy was three years old, and he had a deal with his parents that he wouldn't wake them up first thing in the morning when he woke up as long as there was a sippy cup with juice in the refrigerator so that he could open the fridge, take this, and sit down and watch some cartoons. So he wakes up one morning, and he goes to the refrigerator to try to find his sippy cup, and there's no sippy cup with juice in it, but there was a cup of what he presumed was water down there. So he went, and he started to drink it, and it tasted terrible, and he put it back, and he shut the refrigerator, but decided, I'm not going to wake up my parents anyway, and I will just sit down in front of the TV and watch it. 
Shortly thereafter, Sister Sally wakes up, and she is maybe six or seven years old, and she says, hey, what's going on, Jimmy? Jimmy says, nothing much, Sally. Uh, I didn't have my sippy cup, uh, and whatever it is that was there, it was terrible. Don't drink it. And then she sits down to watch some cartoons, too. And then not long after that, something goes wrong, and little Jimmy is acting weird, and he's having a seizure. Sister Sally wakes up the parents. The parents say, oh, my God, what's happening? And they scoop up their kid, and they take him to the nearest emergency department. And at the emergency department, all they know is this kid is having seizures. And amongst the things that could potentially cause seizures is hypoglycemia. And so when someone has altered mental status and we don't know why, we check to make sure, are they hypoxic, are they hypoglycemic, or perhaps they might be given naloxone to reverse opioid toxicity. Well, they checked this kid's sugar and the sugar was low. And they were asking the story, why the heck did this happen? Does he have a history of hypoglycemia? No. Does anybody in the family have a history of hypoglycemia? No. Are there anybody taking medications for diabetes? No and they can't figure out what's going on until finally they ask Sally and Jimmy what goes on. He says, well, I went to get the sippy cup and it wasn't there and I drank something that was terrible and Dad goes, oh my God. I had some friends over last night and we were drinking and that was vodka that he drank. And everybody says, whoa, that's really kind of weird. He drank some vodka and, and this happened. So they checked the kids serum ethanol level. His serum ethanol level was 55 milligrams per deciliter, whereas the legal limit, as I told you before, is around 80. So that's certainly a high level for someone who's never drunk ethanol before, but it's hardly enough to call him drunk. And you or I getting that drunk, we wouldn't become hypoglycemic from even much higher ethanol levels. So what is it that's happening here? Does this kid's case make any sense? And if so, why was it that he became hypoglycemic? So. I have to talk about glucose homeostasis. So you're going to eat, and so this kid ate last night. Let's say he ate some SpaghettiOs, and the SpaghettiOs went down, and they went into the stomach, and then eventually they went further into the small intestine and got digested. And what we end up with is a whole bunch of sugar all over the body. So the kidney senses that there is relative hyperglycemia, tells the beta islet cells, let's pump out some insulin. So they pump out some insulin and all the sugar goes into the liver and you make some glycogen from it and that will normalize the sugar levels. Well, that's fine. So now the kid goes to sleep and he's fasting. So what happens at night while we're fasting? So at some point your sugar levels are gonna dip and the cells in your pancreas that secrete glucagon say, I will not have this and they secrete some glucagon which causes some breakdown of the glycogen that you have in your liver. But eventually, at some point, your glycogen stores, they are going to run out. And when that happens, we then become dependent upon gluconeogenesis. So remember that. So normally, you eat another meal before the glycogen completely runs out, and the cycle of feeding and fasting continues. But for kids, the overnight fast is the longest because they might go to sleep at 7.30 or 8 p.m. They also have a higher basal metabolic rate, so they have this earlier shift and a more complete shift towards gluconeogenesis compared to adults. Then the kid wakes up, and they get another sugar rush when they eat their frosted flakes. But little Jimmy had a liquid breakfast that was basically just water and ethanol and had essentially zero carbohydrate calories at the time he was dependent upon gluconeogenesis. So remember how ethanol is metabolized. It goes to acetaldehyde through alcohol dehydrogenase, and NAD gets reduced to NADH. Then the acetaldehyde does the same thing to acetic acid. So we are changing the NADH to NAD ratio. Remember that. So then you have your acetyl group. It will go through the citric acid cycle. That's two carbon uh, unit is going to produce plenty of ATP from the ethanol, which is why chronic alcoholics can exist primarily on alcohol, not eating much else. So what happened to little Jimmy is instead of carbohydrates for breakfast, he ingested only ethanol at the exact time he was completely dependent upon gluconeogenesis to maintain his glucose homeostasis. So how is it that the ethanol produced hypoglycemia? We're going to need to review gluconeogenesis to see where ethanol interacts. 
So in a fasting state, we are going to be releasing glycerol and amino acids and fatty acids from the muscle and fat. And then those in the liver are going to get converted to glucose in this long pathway right here from pyruvate all the way to glucose. But pyruvate is always in equilibrium with lactate. It is a single redox step. And what we need is NADH to reduce the pyruvate into lactate. And remember, we shifted the NADH to NAD ratio while ethanol was being oxidized. So every time a molecule of pyruvate is made with the intention of gluconeogenesis, instead it gets shunted over into lactate. You're not making enough glucose, and you can become hypoglycemic. This is just an application of Le Chatelier's principle. So the ethanol hypoglycemia connection has been reported also with ingestion of perfume, which is a lot of ethanol, also with ingestion of mouthwash, which might contain up to around 10% ethanol in it. For this to happen, you probably have to have low glycogen stores. So that means that you have some poor nutritional status. You're either fasting or starved. So chronic alcoholics who don't get well-fed otherwise, presenting to the ED, appearing intoxicated, might be hypoglycemic instead of or in addition to just being drunk. And we can treat hypoglycemia right away, so you don't want to miss this diagnosis. All right, we talked about ethanol intoxication. What about management of ethanol withdrawal? Well, you have to decide. Is this person sick enough that they need to be admitted, or can we give them oral medications and they can be treated as an outpatient? So if they've got abnormal mental status or abnormal vital signs, they probably aren't well enough to go home. If they have metabolic abnormalities, check some serum metabolic panel, for instance, you might want to correct that. But the main treatment is giving some cross-tolerant GABA-A agonist, and benzodiazepines are used most commonly. If you were to use a longer-acting benzodiazepine with a longer half-life, you could perhaps give them a dose. They stop shaking. They stop withdrawing. But because it's long-acting, maybe that's it. Maybe you don't need to give them any more because it will auto-taper. It has a built-in taper as it's being metabolized away. But if they get multiple doses, it might accumulate, cause CNS depression. On the other hand, giving a short-acting benzodiazepine, that might be a better idea in someone who has significant underlying liver disease who isn't going to be metabolizing the drug very quickly to begin with. Which drugs are most commonly used? Chlorodiazepoxide is a benzodiazepine that is most often used for ethanol withdrawal. It goes by the brand name Librium, and it's really hardly ever used for anything else. And that's why I like to prescribe it if I'm going to prescribe anything, because the next time this patient shows up to see a doctor and says I'm on Librium, they know exactly why I gave them the chlorodiazepoxide. But you could use any other benzodiazepine. Another one which is relatively common is chlorazepate and diazepam or any other benzo could be used. But you could use any GABA-A agonist. You might even use ethanol to treat ethanol withdrawal. There are certainly hospitals out there where routinely, if that person is known to chronically consume alcohol, they're given as part of their meals a bottle of wine or a can of beer. Now there are other ways other than through GABA-A agonism that drugs can be used in the treatment of alcoholism. Now, Trexone, a long-acting mu opiate receptor antagonist, can be given either intramuscularly every four weeks or oral daily dosing. And you might think that doesn't make much sense, but part of the CNS reward system can involve endogenous opiates, and if you block those endogenous opiates, then that can help you with your chronic alcoholism. There's another drug called acamprosate that has very poorly understood NMDA receptor antagonist and GABA-A agonist effects. So both of those would be sedating kind of effects. In addition, it is also known for causing some nausea and vomiting. We mentioned before disulfiram, which inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase. It's rarely used in the United States, more commonly used still in Europe. There's an issue with compliance. Why would the patient want to continue taking this medicine if it makes them sick? They have to be really dedicated to want to stop drinking to take disulfiram orally on an outpatient basis.